All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be in Grenoble. So I was asked to give a sort of a concluding slash uh, visions talk, and uh, I think the reaction from some of the people was like this, because uh, probably not the uh, person you would expect to give a concluding talk at the Axion workshop, uh, mainly because uh, the scientific output uh, is in the noise. Uh, the one that is focused on axions. So I don't want to make this as an excuse. So even uh, even so, I would still like I would um, probably I will try to cover as much as I can. And it's also a reason probably why Diego uh, asked me to give this uh, talk. So despite not working much on the axions, I am a fan of axions. So I'm like a person standing on the stands, a fan. Uh, cheering on, and as any, any good sports fan, uh, I also uh, have opinions, and I'm not uh, shy about expressing these opinions. And um, I think one reason why we're here is, uh, if you look at the um, number of papers that are being uh, pushed on the archive, uh, there's this exponential growth in the last years, so that's the birth of the axion, and I measure this in two different ways. So it's either I just it went on spires and I typed the, uh, the title uh, axion alp axionic, or it's it's Weinberg, so you see that it's pretty close. There is a small difference here because then I realized that there's also uh, something in random matrices that is called an alp. All right, so the outline of what I will uh, uh, cover is there will be sort of three parts, the QCD axion, there will be ARPS, and then some other random questions and thoughts. So let me start with the QCD axion. Um, so I think here uh, the community is really lucky, you know, because there's a, if you take a model, there's a well-defined target toward where you're racing. So this is very precious. Uh, the it, to me, it reminds me of, for instance, the unitarization and the Higgs. So you knew that some unitarization had to happen at the LHC energies. It was a well-defined target. It was below 1 TB. Something needed to happen. It was a Higgs, and you had the discovery. So this is this precious band here. I pick a model, and I have, a, I have a expected photon coupling. Now, the crucial thing is, I keep saying, no, it's in a model, and then there is the caveat that uh, Luca and company said, so there are many models, that's the, the flip side of it. So there is uh, the question of how much cancellation you allow in this photon uh, coupling. There was uh, an amoral uh, uh, cancellation introduced by uh, Luca in his talk, and um, what they did is uh, quite reasonable. So you, you look at the models that are otherwise viable, you try to make an educated guess as to the properties of this model, and this would cover uh, different regions depending on what you do. Now, uh, you see that now these arguments are getting closer to what's called naturalness arguments in, in uh, high energy physics. There's some fine tuning that you either allow or you don't allow, or the cancellations. Another thing that might also worry is that this 10 to the minus 10 theta is still technically natural, so there's nothing wrong with 10 to the minus 2, or you can calculate inside the standard model, nothing will go wrong. However, 10 to the minus 2, I mean, it's a number that you would like to understand where this is coming from. So this is uh, another thing to remember. So, Another thing I wanted to point out is there is this region below the usual, uh, the usual QCD axon band. And here I would say, please don't stop searching when you reach the line. No? So please go down if you can, if you can convince the funding agency to do so. Um, another thing that was uh, mentioned by uh, Robert is that also the astrophysics bound, bounds uh, suffer from uh, model dependence. So depending on what you really assume for the flavor dependence of the, the charges in the UV, you can push 
these bounds, maybe it's hard to see, but depending on what to take the model, you'll either stop here, or I change, I'm more bold, I will make generational dependent couplings, and these cancellations are natural now, no? They're just discrete choices of couplings you can leave here. So the mass uh, the, of the axiom can be much further to the, to the right. I think this is an important point to stress. Now, I'll spend uh, the next uh, three slides or so on something that you w know well, uh, but I think there is um, still nice to know what are the error bars, or at least to be to, to try to understand them. So, how well do we know the axiom dark matter relic abundance? Uh, so, here there are these two discrete choices for models. So, either you uh, break Peche Queen before or after inflation. And in both cases, one of the errors is that uh, how well you know the topological susceptibility. So the topological susceptibility uh, gives you the mass of the, the axion. Uh, <coughs> there are two regimes when you, you, your um, universe evolves, when your scale factor grows. Is first you are in the regime where the, the, uh, the Hubble friction dominates, so that's this piece. And then at some point, these two become comparable, and the mass becomes the important one, and you start, uh, start oscillating. And this is, will be the, the oscillation temperature. So the important thing, how well do we know the, the, the topological susceptibility? And here, I think, qualitatively, there was a big uh, jump in the QCD simulations two years ago in this paper where uh, um, uh, the, where they were able to get, I mean, you see this is a log scale. It's really amazing that you can have over many decades, you can control the, the simulation on, on the lattice. So it was really a, a qualitative a jump. Now, of course, there's other groups trying to reproduce this. Uh, there's an interesting claim uh, from the J, uh, Japanese, so JLQCD, uh, that I am showing despite the fact that, you know, there's a well-known rule, whenever you put a question in the title, the answer is always no, so let's read the question. Can axial U1 anomaly disappear at high temperature? Uh, that's the, the statement here, no, is that if I look at the dependence of this uh, susceptibility, you vary the mass, at some point it drops to zero. It seems like there's a change in the slope. This is for two lattice spacings. So that is very peculiar, no? Now the problem is that it happens to small, for the smaller masses where the, uh, the uh, lattice artifacts are bigger. So <coughs> they're also using car forms. I mean, there are many details. So it's not clear that what they're doing is wrong. That's why it's interesting. Uh, also know that this is not the log scale, no? unlike the previous one. And if you plot for these heavier masses, the, uh, the dependence on, on temperature of the susceptibility does follow this dilute instant on gas. So the whole situation is quite intriguing. It would be nice to see what happens in the future. Now, if this were true, no, that suddenly the, the susceptibility would disappear, this would have implications for all this range of uh, axial masses. So this would really be um, an important change. No? It's, you have, we have to keep an eye on it. All right, so there's the other set of uncertainties, which is actually, in my opinion, much bigger, uh, is when you ask about the, the post-inflation models. And there, what you have is a string of network string. And this is hard to simulate because you have very different scales in the problem. There's a scale of the Peche Queen, and this is much, much bigger than the Hubble scale. So for instance, the string tension is controlled by a log, which is of order 70. And if you do a brute force simulation, this log here, you can only uh, make an order of magnitude smaller. Right? So it means it's orders and orders of orders of magnitude in these scales. Now, there was a, a nice uh, idea by uh, Claire and Moore where they put an effective, uh, so they don't really model the, the U1 axiom, but make it a slightly more uh, complicated so that you have an effective model. 
there is a gauge field in the core of the string, there is a global uh, axion outside, and in this way you can tune this kappa. Right? So this is a string tension. If the physics is controlled by the, in the IR, so if I am producing the axions really in the IR at long wavelengths, this uh, simulation should um, reproduce the behavior correctly. Now the question is really, are we dominated by the infrared? And this is something that should be checked. And there was an off-hand comment by uh, Diego for people that were on the uh, on, during the lectures on Monday. You should have learned that actually they are seeing a UV dependence. So maybe uh, this effective model uh, doesn't really reproduce the, the nature. All right. <clears throat> so that's what I wanted to say about the QCD axions. So now I move on to the apps. It's too bad ring will disappear because I have many jokes about the uh, name of apps. I think it's, a, I mean, it's a, an amazing acronym. It's really, I love it. No, it's really nice. Uh, so that's why I will make a, a few jokes about it. Uh, so originally it's meant axion-like particles. Now with ARP2 we learned that it can also mean any light particle. What it does is, essentially you just relate this uh, relation between the axion mass and the, uh, the decay constant. So instead of being in this uh, band of, uh, of usual QCD axion models, you can either be well above or well below. Now the motivation comes from many places. Uh, <coughs> You can also say that ARP now means axion less proper if you're cynical because it's not sitting in the QCD band. Uh, one motivation would be, for instance, from the exivert. This is being thrown around. So what you would find is that, for instance, if you look at the how many axions a typical Calabi R would give you, it would be tens of axions. And then uh, you would say, anything is likely possible. There's also a question, where are they? If they're tense, where the hell are they? And then there is also, I could mean an absent light particle. Uh, I think, okay, so it's really a motivation about the experiments, no? So I think what you should take out of all of these jokes with completely bombed, I see, is that, <laughs> um, the art should really mean the following. No, it means ask less, just probe. And I think this is the thing that I really took out of this workshop. No, is that there is many experiments, and probably I would bet that the progress will be driven by the experiments. So I go uh, through this flood of experiments. The talks that we heard about was the ADMX by Nicole, and there was also the SE circuit, which is supposed to get a sexy name, no? The oscillating neutron EDMs, the storage ring EDMs, there was the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Casper, oh, it's too many things already, quarks, I mean, this is really amazing. You try to start probing new different couplings, GNOME, we just heard uh, uh, in the morning, and then there was the possibility of mini cluster uh, uh, from femtolensing, the Ariadne, the axion searches at the LSC, which we just heard uh, a few minutes ago. So here I would, uh, the only thing I really want to say is that, you know, there was this mirror uh, symmetry Z2 choice, whether you take the one over lambda or the F, and if we're looking at, at the ARPS, I think this is a much more natural thing because you climb the ARPS, you don't dive into the ARPS. No? So if you want to climb the ARPS, so I would strongly suggest that the whole community now changes to this other choice. <laughs> and then there are many more that uh, there were not even talks there. No? So there's Madmex, Abracadabra, Yaxo, Kest, Orpheus, Organ. K projects, haystack. So I mean, it's really you know, it's piling on. If you're a person from the outside of community, it's just amazing. No, it's really a lot of activity. All right. So I think one uh, way of thinking about this is that we are at the stage where it's a fishing expedition, and what we are doing is something like when you go 
whale watching, you look at the distance and you're searching for a tail. No? And as soon as you find the tail, you will know you saw a whale. No? So we're searching for the first signal and then we want to we'll, uh, know what kind of a beast is. Okay, I'm simplifying because the situation probably looks more like this. So that's the, the hero experimentalist. No, has uh, the best goggles, uh, golden goggles you can possibly have. It's looking at the distance, trying its best, and it's trying to figure out whether it's on the sea or it's in the jungle, and the way it looks something like this. And how do you do this? Now, how can you do this? I think the only way is that you have to make as many measurements as possible. I think this is really a qualitatively uh, new thing in the last uh, few years that you will be able to reconstruct many features of the axion, the whale, uh, not just the masses and the photon coupling, but if you look at the many different couplings, we'll know much more. All right, so what are the couplings? The couplings are to the photon, to the gluon, and then to the fermions. So essentially, it would mean photons, nucleons, and the electron. Now you already see that I'm overselling because there are only so many things you can measure. There will be a few parameters that you will measure. You will not be able to, of course, uh, go one-to-one -one into the UV model, but many of the UV model would disappear. Uh, <coughs> like, even if you just look the photons versus electrons versus mass, they're very distinguished, you know? So just think the, the two most uh, vanilla uh, types of models. There are also some much more specific signatures in, in specific uh, uh, models. For instance, one thing that, uh, that Robert talked about was the oxyflavon. So here, this is very specific, no? because uh, you will have a flavor violet in decay. We're going to take a strange core, goes to a D core plus the, the axial. So you have a coupling like this. If you dress it with uh, other quarks, you'll have a K on to pi on plus the, the uh, oxyflavon, so the axion. You can predict the branching ratio, and if you see this, uh, if you see this transition, along with the discovery in let's say one of the typical axion searches, like if you can see, see the gamma gamma uh, um, coupling, you would know that this is the oxyflavon. You find the axion, and on top of it, you find the flavor changing transition. This is an oxyflavon. All right, it's, it cannot be just the usual, uh, the usual axion because if you look at the same transition where the flavor transition is mediated by the standard model W, this is many orders of magnitude smaller. All right, so you're you you are in a completely different regime. All right, so the axiflavon summary plot, the bound is here, the present bound from k to pi a, and you can push it. A decade or more or so uh, below. All right. There's another type that was mentioned by uh, Carlos. For instance, if you're in guts, they're also going to be an accompanied typical gut signature, the proton decay. All right. So, example like this. All right. So, I came to the random thoughts and questions. So, we heard a talk by Francesca Calore. There is this potential signal that is being seen, seen in gamma ray pulsars. Uh, if you convert into bounds, so it looks like this, no? There's uh, the mass and the coupling. Uh, so the mass is in the, the nano electron volts. Now, what goes into converting this into the, the coupling to the photons is the knowledge of the the magnetic field, so if you are more generous, I don't know, with the error bars, maybe this uh, exclusion by cost, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's a little bit more model dependent. It's nice that it's in a regime where uh, ALP2 would be able to, to also probe this, if this is a real thing. There's also a signal in 21 centimeters, so this, of course, thing, the first thing you would ask is whether this can be explained by an axion, and then two days uh, earlier there was this uh, paper where the claim is that you can do it. Uh, now the thing is that 
photon coupling is typically too small to do something like this, so what they invoke is a gravitational cooling, which I try to understand, and the only thing I really understood that is very controversial, so I'm not sure if uh, I was supposed to even show this slide. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's good to know that maybe, maybe uh, this is out there. There's also a question of uh, biogenesis and leptogenesis. So if, let's see, if in the future we find the axion, it's a dark matter, it's awesome, no? We're left with one less problem. The remaining question, for instance, would be the origin of matter-antimatter symmetry. And this can also work in uh, axions. I mean, there are a, a few options, but one was put forward in the rare axion cosmology by Tevon. So what he needed was, he needed higher dimensional operators, and then some CP uh, violation, and the rest is sort of a typical uh, 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 biogenesis story. There's, uh, there's an interference between two diagrams, there's CP violation, and so on. All right. <coughs> the other question is why is uh, Petra Queen uh, symmetry so precise? And the worry here is really if you have uh, quantum gravity entering as power corrections. You know, so if you have one or n Planck to some power uh, corrections, so if it's not exponentially suppressed, uh, that uh, that can be very uncomfortable. You have to go to very high powers if f is comparable to the Planck scale, or is not uh, very, very small. So one solution was shown by Quentin, where essentially he has a clockwork type um, solution to it with uh, gauged uh, U1s, with one remaining global uh, symmetry. There's also a Duratal uh, variant of this. So by gauging things, you can protect against quantum gravity, or as uh, Diego said, the F could be just much, much lower, and then you live in the LHC uh, uh, mass region. There was also a question of uh, what if you find a non-zero theta. So there are, of course, many uh, experiments looking for the EDMs. Um, so this would be um, really great no? if we find a, a theta non-zero. Um, one question you can ask is how do we know if we are looking at theta equal non-zero and not some other CP violating source? There is also the, the, uh, the quark um, electric dipoles and so on. The chroma electric dipoles, I mean there is uh, quite a few parameters that we saw. And the way to go about it is again you measure with different probes, neutron, proton, blah, blah, blah. Right? Uh, the curiosity that I also put on this slide is that if you find a theta which is non-zero, you would also generate an electron EDM. So this would be at this, um, in the effective theory, at this uh, three-loop diagram. In here, there's a hidden uh, CP violating uh, term which is proportional to theta. And the number would be, so you take the theta uh, that you measure, you multiply by 10 to the minus 28, and you get the electron uh, uh, EDM, which is, for the case of 10 to the minus 10, is <coughs> it's a mere 10 orders of magnitude away from the present experiment. All right, so that's what I wanted to say. Uh, the conclusion is axial searches are going through an explosive period of growth. It was a fun workshop, and thank you for inviting me.